Hello, I'm coming to you today to go over the Apocalypse um, IRAM M72 multi-board. This device installs into an IRAM, IRAM M72 and allows a single arcade board to run the entire library of M72 games. The IRAM M72 came out in the mid-90s and was responsible for a lot of IRAM's big arcade hits like R-Type and Image Fight, Dragon Breed, uh, Air Duel, uh, Mr. Heli, uh, Legend of Hero Tanma, Ninja Spirit, um, R-Type, well, not R-Type 2, but that came on a later board. But anyway, all those IRAM boards are pretty uncommon now, and individual boards go for many hundreds of dollars, in some cases thousands of dollars. So having one device like this that would allow us to run the entire library of IRAM games off one M72 donor board is pretty exciting. So Apocalypse also um, patched uh, R-Type 2 and Lightning Sword, which both ran on M84 hardware to run on this board as well. So altogether you can turn one IRAM M72 board into 12 IRAM M72 games essentially. I'll put a full list of all the games it supports in the uh, show notes. But Apocalypse uh, designed the board and uh, Mitsurugi X, aka Walls Dog Arcade here, I was responsible for assembling the units and shipping them out, and all the whole projects uh, hosted on the uh, Dark Soft Arcade Projects forum. So I'll put some links to the show notes there. So this unit, um, as you can see here, there's a primary um, board here, and that's going to mount on top of the M72 stack. Um, the EEPROMs that come with it are blank. You can save some money by having uh, by supplying your own EEPROMs, but I decided to have them send them along just so I wouldn't have to source them myself. Um, there's a dip switch right here that you use to select the library. These connection pins can also be used for a digital switcher that might come later. You know, rather than using dip switches, you might be able to select it from an LCD board. There's an LCD board from the Darksoft uh, STV multi that might work great for that. So. Uh, hopefully we'll see some work there. And uh, if I flip this over, the other unit that shipped to it is the secondary board that's going to mount on the, well, you'll see when I break out the M72 donor, but it's a three-stack board. And so the main board you saw on the other side mounts on top, and this mounts in the middle. And, um, and there's a connection power cable that goes between them. And also in the package here was a uh, power cable and um, there's a uh, protection chip. Um, let's see, let me make sure I get this right. So there's a special PAL chip and a uh, MCU chip here that um, takes care of the protection. The original IRM boards were um, had copy protection measures on them and Apocalypse developed this um, special um, uh, MCU that would uh, work across all of the games. So, okay, so this is the kit. Next, um, I'll pull out the M72 donor that this is gonna go into. Um, so, one sec. Okay, so here's my M72 donor that I'm going to use for this multi. As you can see, it's a very large board. Um, in this case, my donor is uh, Dragon Breed, and um, if you look from the side, you can see that it's a triple board stack with these spacers that keep the three boards separated apart. Um, with my kit, my multi-kit did not come with the new spacers. Um, I was in a hurry, so I told um, Mits Mitsurugi X that I would supply my own spacers. Um, the reason you need them is that with the subboard mounted in between, uh, the boards can rub together with the standard uh, spacers, and we don't want that. So, as part of this installation process, we will be uh, installing taller spacers. So, um, before we start with um, disassembling the triple board stack here and programming the EEPROMs on the multi, Let's go ahead and just plug in the donor real quick and make absolutely sure it works. Naturally, you want to make sure your donor works before you start. Um, oh, one other thing I'll mention is that any M72 original game will work for this uh, multi-solution, except R-Type, sadly. 
the original R-Type, while being the most common M72 board, is missing some of the sampling hardware um, on the primary ROM board here that um, the multi needs. So sadly, you have to find something different than the original R-Type to work as a donor. But Okay, so we'll cut here and test this board donor out real fast. Okay, so I've hooked Dragon Breed, uh, my M72 donor here, up to a Haas Super Gun that I use in my test setup here. I uh, just have a Saturn controller that I'm using, and then uh, this is all running off an arcade power supply. I'll go into a Sony PVM here. So let's go ahead and plug things in. And it looks scary when you see all these random patterns on the screen, but that's just the board's startup test, so we'll just give it a moment here. Okay, looks good. We got picture, we got music. Go ahead and drop in some quarters. Now normally there's a status bar at the bottom, but M72 by nature seems to run the screen a little tall and it just gets cut off. That really is just something with this monitor. Nothing to worry about. And yep, the board seems to be working just fine, so I'll go ahead and pull the power and we'll get to work on um, taking the original ROMs out of this and uh, putting in the multi. Oh, and I'll also cover programming Ape ROMs too, so that'll be next. Okay, so we've got the M72 back on the workbench, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start separating the triple board stack here to get it ready for the uh, multi. So, first thing to do is just the easy step of carefully popping open these release ribbons. Oh, and I'll also note that I've got an anti-static, oops, there we go, anti-static strap on while I'm doing all this. You definitely don't want to burn out an expensive arcade board uh, just with a little bit of static electricity so definitely make sure you're grounded while working with any of these bare PCBs. Okay there's that and now we've also got a power cord right here that we will carefully undo. There we go and the power connector right here Oops, that little guy. Sorry, I wasn't showing it on camera. Here we go. We'll pop that end off of there. And we need to separate this. I don't know if I can do that one-handed, so in fact, I'll just oops, pull this little ribbon out of this clasp right here. Hard to do this one-handed. I will be getting a tripod for later videos, but this one's just kind of doing it off the cuff, so forgive the unsteady camera work. There we go. So now that line is loose. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some pliers here, and I'm not going to do it on camera because it will take two hands, but what I'll do is I'll carefully pinch these class in on Looks like it's actually got a little bit of a uh, screw mount right here. So anyway, I will carefully separate all these fasteners and use it to separate the triple board stack. So let me go ahead and cut here and I'll do that. Okay, so we're back and taking a closer look at this, these spacers actually aren't fastened down. So I don't need to remove them from the board yet, although I still may need to later to uh, give a little more clearance. But what we do have holding it down were these uh, four little fastener nuts. Two here and then two more up here. So I already took three of them off. I figured I'd save the last one for on camera here. So we'll just pop that little nut off. I loosened it earlier with pliers and take the washer off like so. Setting those aside. And now, let's see if I can do this with pulling the camera. Let's see, it looks like we might still have something else holding it in place, so one second. So yeah, there is a little white connector between the boards here. We've got one on this side and one on the opposite side. 
So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to carefully pry up on that, just using fingers, be really gentle. Ooh, it pops up easier than it looks. There we go. And now the top board is separated from the stack. All right, so I'm gonna carefully set this aside and we'll move on to the next one. Okay, now that the top board is out of the way, we can see the middle board here. Um, there's an interesting factory uh, bodge wire connecting things here. I notice that it's looking perhaps a little rusty around where it connects right there. There's definitely some kind of discoloration, so I might look at that under the microscope here in a few minutes and see if that really is rust. If it is, then uh, definitely want to clean that up while we're in here so it doesn't spread further and cause any damage. Otherwise, things are looking pretty good. Um, with the middle board here and the bottom board, turns out the, uh, the little plastic spacers here are what actually hold them together in this case, and then the connectors are really just these ribbons. So um, I should be able to just go ahead and use pliers carefully on the tips. Whoops, where are they? <laughs> there they are, right over here. So I'll just carefully use pliers on those to separate this middle board from the bottom board. So again, that's hard to do one-handed, so I'm gonna cut and I'll be right back. Okay, I've done undone all the fasteners, so I'm gonna again, carefully lift this off. And now we can see we've only got the bottom board left. So we've got our triple stack separated and Next, we'll be ready to start pulling the original ROMs from these boards so that we can replace them with the multi-unit. So let me go ahead and carefully set this middle board aside and we'll get started on that. All right, so I've now got a piece of anti-static foam ready that we're gonna set these mask ROMs into. And um, what I've also done is the labels on these don't necessarily correspond very well to what they fit into. So B1, B0, and it doesn't really match a B1 or B0 on there. In fact, both of these are labeled K807. So just to be sure that we don't get them confused if I ever put this board back again to stock, eventually I've gone ahead and prepped some uh, labels and I'll label each mask ROM as we take it out. Um, as far as removing the mask ROMs go, the key thing is, well, there's two key things. One is, is that you don't want to gouge the board up underneath with your tool when you're prying it out. And um, you don't want to bend the pins on the mask ROM if you can avoid it. Um, you can bend them back, but you know, if you bend them back and forth too much, they will snap off and we don't want that. Um, um, so, you know, spending a little bit on some nice tools helps a lot. I've got this angled pry bar here that does a really good job that I ordered from uh, ArcadeComponents.com for a couple of dollars. It really just looks like a flathead screwdriver, but just the angle and the slow bevel on the end makes it work pretty well. Um, another, oops, come back, focus. What happened to my focus? There we go. No cooperation. Okay, the other tool I like to have is this is a chip remover. Um, generally, I prefer this tool when it works. There's some longer chips that this won't fit that um, I use the, the pry tool for instead. But what's nice with this is that you can, this is not, come on focus. Come on focus. There we go. Okay, so what we can do is with this is we just carefully set that over, squeeze the handle and it's gonna clench. And again, I can't do this on camera because I have to have another hand ready to hold the board down. But the idea is you hold the board steady and while you squeeze the handle and lift up, kind of wiggle it a little and this will just lift it straight out of the socket without compromising the pins. So. Um, I will go ahead and pull these ROMs and then be right back to you. Okay, so I went and got a light on here to help the camera focus a little better. So I've gone down the line here and pulled the eight mask ROMs out of the subboard and labeled them as I brought them off. Um, rather than labeling them according to the sockets they came out of like B1, B0, B2, B3, 
I decided to just go one through eight and I labeled it D just because this is the M72 uh, BD board with a big D. So as I said, that'll be so if I ever decide to revert this back to stock, then we'll know where these chips go. I'm a little embarrassed, but I made a mistake and I overlooked the jumper settings that need to be set on this board. So um, both the A board and C board have a variety of these little jumpers. You can see J1 and J2 right here and J3 and uh, a few more over here. In fact, there's 12 jumpers on the A board and uh, I believe uh, six of them on the C board. All right, so now I'm going to take that out of the way, and we're going to go ahead and grab the uh, subboard here. Okay, and what we want to be careful of when we're putting this in is we got to make sure the pins line up correctly with the sockets. Let's see if I can get this on camera here, but uh, I'll show the bottom of the board. So the multi-board, you can see the pins that extend down. The second row is kind of shorter than the others, and it's just because not all of the address paths are used, but we want to make sure that the long row of pins corresponds to the bottom of, um, well, I shouldn't say bottom, but to the correct spots on these. So, all right, so what I'm going to do, let's get a side view here, and Again, I might not entirely do this on camera just because it's hard to do one-handed, but you can see if I, as I start to tilt this in here, you get the idea of where the pins are supposed to slot in. So I'm going to turn the camera off and get this secured into place, but it really is just a matter of lining your pins up very carefully and then pressing firmly down to anchor the subboard in place. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and be right back. Okay, so I've got this lined up, although I haven't pressed it down into place yet. But you can see the right edge of the pins on the multi subboard are lined up with the right side of the sockets correctly. And naturally, when we're looking at it from the top, you know, we're going to have the uh, text of the board right side up along the, you know, to match the label of the M72 board itself. Um, when looking at it from the other side, sure if that will focus yeah so again you can see not all the pins are used but generally um, you want this board to be right aligned um, in that the pins line up on the right side even though not all the pins will be used on the left side and uh, if you go back and look at earlier in the video you may have noticed that the uh, mask ROMs uh, the original mask ROMs were right aligned as well there is some unused pins to the left so all right, anyway, so things are lined up, so now I'm just going to carefully press this down into place. Um, let's see, again, I think I'm going to use two hands, so I'm going to set the camera down. Be right back. Okay, so I have the subboard pressed into place. Um, it did end up taking two hands, so I did have to set the camera down. But um, what I actually ended up doing was kind of just using firm, even pressure and just carefully gently, well, I shouldn't say gently, it did take a little bit of uh, pressure to press it into place and what I ended up doing actually is I ended up holding it vertically like a sandwich and then pressing my hand, holding one hand against the back to hold it steady while using my other hand to press down on the subboard from the front and that was just to minimize the amount of board flexing. Uh, I don't want the board flexing too much like you'd get on a flat surface just because these standoffs uh, hold it up a little bit and likewise you don't want the pins on the bottom of the board uh, pressing down onto your tabletop and getting bent up or damaged. This is looking pretty good. Um, there's still a little bit of a gap showing on the pins um, but I believe it is as fully seated as it will get. Uh, I think that having just a little bit of gap on the pins is perfectly normal. You know, when you, when it all drops into place, you'll feel it. There's a point where the pins kind of just latch down and lock. So 
It's one of those things where you'll know it's seated when you feel it. All right, so this is looking good, and I think we're done with the bottom board for now. So let's go ahead and move on up to the A board, where we will be repeating the same operation of removing the mask ROMs and um, installing the multi in their place. Be right back. Okay, so we've got the A board lined up here. I've got the notch in facing to the lower left, which puts the, uh, let's see, so it puts the logo of the donor, that will focus, right side up right here, and then the writing on each of these ICs facing right side up. With that orientation, the uh, multi main board here will have its dip switches in the upper left hand corner with the uh, Mitsurugi Walls Dog Arcade logo facing down on, on the lower left hand corner. And so this whole unit will transplant to where those mask ROMs are. So just like with the bottom board before, I'm going to use my chip puller to remove each of the mask ROMs in the two columns. You'll notice as I was mentioning earlier, that some of these sockets, the chip doesn't expand the full width of the socket, they're right aligned. So when we install the multi, uh, we're also gonna wanna make sure that the pins are right aligned. And uh, since we've got two columns of chips here, rather than just numbering them one to eight like I did on the bottom board, I think this time I will go ahead and uh, mark my labels up here um, with the uh, socket that they came out of. So we've kinda got it's a little small here. You see H3 and uh, H0, and on these right ones we've got, um, it looks like I0, 0, 0. Is that a 0? Maybe it's the, maybe those are letters, not numbers on these ones. Anyway, I'll just make sure the labels match uh, when I pull these out so that um, if we ever need to revert this, we can uh, make sure everything goes back in the right place. All right, so I am going to pull some ROMs and then be right back. So now I've gone ahead and I've pulled all the mask ROMs off the A board. And again, I labeled them and set them aside here. Um, you can see I just uh, labeled everything from the bottom board, the D board starting with a D, and everything from the A board starting with an A. Um, and now we're ready to go ahead and just drop this into this area here. It's going to be a similar process where we'll want to make sure we get the pins lined up really nice first and then we'll apply careful force um, using my hand to support the back of the board and um, pressing on the front of this board until it kind of drops down into the sockets. So let me go ahead and set these aside and we may cut here. Hang on, we'll find out. Yeah, I think I'll cut so I can get the multi out of the foam here and get it lined up first. So I'll be right back. Okay, so I've got the main multi board lined up and ready to drop in here. One thing I wanted to point out before pressing it into place is remember I said that everything needs to be right aligned. So you'll notice with these pins here that there is one pin unused at the end. So we want to make sure that this board is right aligned and not left aligned or else the addressing won't match up right. So. Yep, so just make sure you got everything lined up correctly and right aligned going up all the sockets and then you can carefully and gently press it together and again I'll have to do that off camera because I need two hands. Okay, so now I've got this pressed into place. You can see here that uh, now the pins are pressed securely down into the sockets all the way down the length of the board. Hopefully that shows up all right on camera. Uh, this one dropped into place a lot more easily than the uh, bottom board did, so that was nice. Okay, so now that the main board is installed on our A board here, we still have an Intel uh, MCU and an i8751 that's used for copy protection. We'll be swapping that out for a generic um, that Apocalypse has prepared that works across all the games. And then there's also a programmable GAL chip included that will be going right here, uh, which was also an, another form of copy protection that Apocalypse worked around. So pulling these is just like pulling uh, the ROM chips. Um, this 
even though this technically isn't a ROM, um, it goes into a socket exactly like one and you pull it out the same way of a chip puller. Okay, so I pulled the MCU and now um, I wanted to catch this on camera. My other pry tool, the professional pry tool, wouldn't fit, so instead I took a very thin jeweler screwdriver and I'm going to slide it in here and just oh so gently work that up a little bit going across. Just being careful not to pry too much. You can see it's halfway out there. So now we'll come in from the other side. Don't want to catch that ceramic capacitor, so I'm going to be very careful here. Just lift that up a little bit. There we go, popped right out. Okay, so these are the replacement components that came in the bag. I haven't pressed them all the way into place yet. I just wanted to point out that um, when installing mask ROMs and, thing, and whatnot, there's going to be a notch on the chip that you want to line up with the notch that's printed on the board. Likewise, over here with the gallery replacing, um, you can see there's a notch printed there on the uh, uh, board. So just make sure your notches line up, make sure your pins are lined up so you don't end up with pins poke extending off the edges and then just uh, press them gently into place so I'm gonna do that on camera right here with that just press that in looks like it might be sitting up a little bit there we go that's flush and then with the MCU here maybe we can do it on camera I think we can I've got it all lined up so I'm just going to press, press that firmly into place. And again, I don't want to flex the board, so just to be sure, I'm just going to support it from the back here and apply the pressure. And if we look at it from the sides, yeah, that looks really well seated, so that's good to go. Okay, so the next thing we need to do before we start reassembling is the EEPROMs that were supplied with this kit still need to be programmed. Um, they're all shipped blank. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to um, remove these chips from the multi using my chip puller and then I will use an EEPROM programmer to program them with the uh, uh, game code. So, um, I won't show that for all the chips, but I will show it for um, one of them so you understand how the process works. So, um, I think we'll go ahead and just start with this bottom most one right here. Um, so, let me go ahead and get that pulled off camera and get the ROM set ready, and uh, I'll show you how we program the chip. Okay, so I've downloaded the uh, ROM pack for the IRAM M72 Multi. Smoke Monster has done a great job of um, supporting all of the uh, Darksoft and Apocalypse multis with ROM packs. So fortunately on the Arcade Projects forum, um, it's pretty easy to just get a link and download it and extract it, and here we are. So you see that there's 10 ROM files, just labeled 110, and over here on the multi, we can see underneath the sockets, there we've got uh, 1 and 2, and... Further up here we've got, there's number six, and five, and four, and then the others would be on the uh, subboard. So um, what we do is I can see I've pulled the uh, EEPROM, the supplied EEPROM from slot one, and what we need to do is we're going to look, actually before we get into identifying the model of the ROM, let me show you what the programmer looks like. So I have an EE Tools Chip Max 2 here. Um, this is a little bit more medium grade um, chip programmer. Um, it just supports a wider range of chips and is a little more reliable than a lower end programmer. But um, I also have this Wellon VP390. That was my low end programmer that I used for quite a while and uh, it does an excellent job and was relatively inexpensive. So. I keep the VP390 around because there's still a few older um, EEPROMs that only it seems to be able to recognize and work with, but most of the time I use the Chipmax 2 um, just because it seems to be a little more consistent. 
Um, so in addition to programming EEPROMs, you can also um, dump ROMs and mask ROMs, and that can be useful when you're um, troubleshooting a board. Um, you can dump an image of the chips and then compare it against, compare the checksum of what you dumped against MAME and see if the checksums differ, and if they do, you might have a failed chip. Um, third thing to point out here is also just have an EEPROM eraser, and um, if you have a chip that you want to erase, if it was programmed incorrectly or whatever, you can just drop it into the drawer here, set it for about half an hour, and it uses an infrared light um, through these uh, windows here on the EEPROMs to erase them. So anyway, this is a nice inexpensive like $10 um, tool to have, and uh, it's a must if you're do much work with EEPROMs. So, okay, so we're gonna get the chip max ready for this. So what we need to do is we need to look, let me see if this will focus here, there we go. So we can see that this EEPROM is an, an STM27C322. So, on my computer here, I'm just gonna launch the EE tool software for the chip max. Should have had it open already, but there we go, and we need to select the type of chip that we're going to be working with. So I'll just type it into the search here, M27C322, and it's an ST brand, 42 pin dip, and there we are, ready to roll. Now I'll take the EEPROM, and we'll Open the clasp, drop it in here with the window, the notch again should be facing up with the pins aligned to the bottom of the socket. Press down firmly and then we'll close it. And now over here back on the software we need to say what chip we're going to program, or sorry, what data we're going to program. So we'll go to open, go to the desktop and find our IRAM M72 folder, version two of the new boards, and we're gonna load ROM number one, and we look good to go. So, what we'll do first is we'll make sure the chip is blank, and it is. Um, if it wasn't for some reason, that's where we would throw it into the chip programmer and let it cook for half an hour to make sure it was blank. But it all looks good, so I'm going to tell it to program. So we got the little progress bar filling up here. Busy light is on on the chip max. These are large EEPROMs, so it will take, you know, looks like it might take a good minute or two here to program. So I will do a cut and just uh, resume when it gets close to the end. Okay, so now our programming is at 99%, and it does a final verify pass and says that it verified that it was blank, verified that it was programmed, and finally uh, double-checked the data to make sure it matched the file, and it all checked out. So this EEPROM is programmed and ready to drop back in the board. Window in the middle of the EEPROM um, as I mentioned, that is a, that if infrared light gets into there, it um, erases the chip. So it's usually a good idea to cover those up um, once the chip has been programmed. Some people just use electrical tape. I like to be a little more professional, and I've ordered some um, special uh, EEPROM stickers that go over those. And um, but really, just as long as you're covering it up um, so that sunlight or other uh, infrared light can't get through, then your ROM should be okay. So anyway, that is the process of programming the ROM. I just need to repeat this nine more times for the other EEPROMs in the kit. So I'm going to reinstall this one back into the multi, cover its window with a sticker, and then um, go ahead and run through the other nine of them, and then I'll pick up the video from there. Okay, so I was just working my way through programming the EEPROMs, and I hit a small snag that I thought I would show you. So you can see I already got uh, the first four ROMs programmed here. They were all the same type of chip, so that wasn't a problem. And then when I went up here to do uh, U6, ROM 6, um, I loaded it up correctly. Um, 
But then when I went to actually program the chip, it came back and said that um, it was an incorrect device ID. And uh, it turns out that's because that one ROM is a different model. Let me see if that'll focus here. You can see that this is an M27C160, and that is a different model of chip than the M27C322 that the first four ROMs were. So, just to illustrate, when I try to program it, And so that's a good double check where um, the uh, chip programmer will, uh, there's like a little uh, encoding inside the EEPROM where it marks what kind of EPROM it is. And um, so the programmer, of course, checks to make sure that you've selected the correct model of chip before it tries to write to it. And it will warn you if that doesn't match. In this case, uh, the solution to fixing this problem is uh, to just, of course, pick the correct type of chip. So we will abort, and then we will go to select a new chip, and this one was the M27 C160. And again, it's from ST. And you see we got a couple of choices here. Um, this type of EEPROM was offered in multiple uh, layouts like uh, surface mount chips. We we're using the DIP package where the 42 pins come out of the bottom. These other two chips are 44 pin packages. So we know that's the right one. We'll hit OK and then drop it back into our programmer again. Close the clasp and once again we will attempt to program. All right, this time no warning messages and the chip is programming properly. So everything's looking good. I will go ahead and uh, we'll get this chip finished programming, put it into the main board, and then I will program the ROMs that are on the sub board and be right back to you. All right, I'm still waiting for the some of these EPROMs to program on the sub board. So while that's happening, let's talk about these, these separators. So, um, if you order one of these multi-kits from Mitsurigi, he'll include spacers that are tall enough um, with the kit. Um, I'll mention again that if you look, the subboard sits a little higher up than just the mask ROMs alone um, that were in there originally were. And so to st if we leave the original spacers in place, it will scrape, this bottom board will scrape against the middle board. And we definitely don't want that. So the idea is that we just want to replace, there's five, three, three in the back. We want to replace these spacers with something just a little bit taller than the originals. So I've got a random bin of fasteners here. And it just so happens, I think the ones that are in this bag here, I've got a bag full of these. These should do the job nicely. Oh boost that board up a couple of millimeters. So I'm not going to swap these on camera because again that's kind of a two-handed operation but um, I'll just use my pliers to carefully squeeze the, uh, the releases here on the bottom side of the board and then just pluck them out and then um, these new ones will have to have a little, a little nut um, screwed into the bottom of them and I'll put a little washer in there too so that it doesn't uh, rub on the board. So anyway, I will do that off camera and uh, be back to you shortly. All right, so I finished programming all of the EPROMs and I'm happy to report that um, that um, EPROM on the top board that uh, didn't program correctly earlier did program successfully on the second pass after it had been erased, so no problems there. And you'll see that I swapped out uh, those uh, smaller spacers for some taller ones so the boards won't rub against each other. And I also added some PCB feet to the bottom. That's just so that when um, it's sitting, when you're actually using the board, that it isn't sitting flat on um, whatever surface you're using the board on. So always having PCB feet on your arcade boards is a good idea just so they don't 
the pins on the bottom don't get bent by the table or um, things don't accidentally short out somehow. But anyway, so now um, if we would normally be ready to start reassembling everything. Um, we've got the multi boards in place, we got all the EPROMs programmed, um, we got the taller spacers put in. Um, but you may recall earlier in the video, I noticed that the middle board of the stack, the B board, um, had a bodge wire, a connecting wire that um, the factory installs to correct a defect in the uh, circuitry. And it looked like on one side of that bodge that um, there may have been some corrosion. So we're going to uh, take a deep, uh, <coughs> we're going to take a careful look at that to uh, make sure that. Um, you know, if there is rust forming there, we definitely want to get rid of it because it will spread and uh, cause all kinds of problems. So let me uh, swap boards here and uh, we'll take a closer look at that. All right, so here's the B board and you can see the blue bodge wire working its way up here. And I actually oriented it in such a way that I could have a look at it through my microscope here. And let me see if the camera will let me get a macro zoom. You can see how it looks a little bit brown and suspicious, but after taking a really good look at it under the microscope of good lighting, I'm happy to report that it, it looks like it's just dried flux and it's not um, rust like I was worried about. Um, it does look brown, it did look like it was bubbling up a little bit right there, but it actually is just caked on um, flux, so there really isn't a problem. Nevertheless, I think I will take some isopropyl alcohol and a toothbrush here and uh, scrub that up and clean it up nicely. Um, so give me one second to prep those tools and I'll show that on camera. I've got a toothbrush and some isopropyl here. I'm just going to uh, get that ready. And then I'll just come in right here. Hold the camera steady. I'm just going to scrub that up nice and gentle like. Just it's a wire. We're not, it's a wire, so we want to be really gentle with it and not accidentally rip it away from its connection on the board. And since we're just removing flux, it should just come peel right off with the isopropyl anyway. a lot better. It doesn't have that ugly brown staining that it had before, so that looks a lot better. Now the other thing I noticed when I was uh, pulling this out is you can see that the uh, JAMA connector right here is also looking pretty tarnished. Um, good tool to use on these actually is just an eraser, um, either a pencil eraser or one of those gray um, art erasers. Um, I um, you just go and rub that over the pins, you know, don't use Brasso, don't use, um, you know, anything aggressive like that. Um, it can eat through the, uh, you know, the connections. And so uh, a good pencil eraser will do the job, even uh, scrubbing a little bit with a toothbrush will probably do a lot to loosen up some of that grit. Um, let me grab a pencil eraser and uh, we'll tackle that next. Okay, it took me more trouble than I thought to track down a pencil eraser. Uh, I used up my last one, so I've got one now, and I'm going to go ahead and scrub up this side of the connector on camera. Um, when I flip it over to do the other side, um, I'll probably do that off camera because this heat sink is going to really get in the way of allowing the board to uh, sit evenly. Uh, so I'll just have to use both hands to support it um, when I do the opposite side. But for this side at least, you'll be able to see kind of what the deal is and just go ahead and scrub away at it here. You can see it's starting to look a little bit shinier. There's still a little bit of rust. This one's tarnished enough that it will take a fair bit of scrubbing I think to get a lot of these to clean up. I may end up hitting them with a little bit of uh, isopropyl and the uh, toothbrush anyway, just to see if I can really loosen up some of the ground in stuff. Yep, 
Yeah, it's getting there. I mean, it's looking a little shinier, but there's still a fair bit of tarnish. That's better, but not where I want it to be. Let's uh, let's grab the toothbrush and some isopropyl and give that a try. So I'll close the lid on it. Let's go ahead and open it back up here. Soak up a little bit. Getting a little bit of IPA on the uh, label there, but it'll dry up and get the IPA will dry and it'll still look fine afterwards as long as we don't. All right, so that's that's a lot better. I'm going to go ahead and cut here and then do the other side, and then we'll start putting things back together. Before putting things back together, I thought we'd take one more look at that uh, bodge wire that I cleaned up with the isopropyl and the toothbrush. So if I switch to the zoom here, you can see that indeed the isopropyl and the toothbrush cleaned it right up, and now there's none of that yucky caked on browned gross stuff that uh, looked suspiciously like rust before. So, uh, yep, that uh, looks good to me. Still a good solid connection on that wire. And then over here, the other end where it fastens. Let's see if it'll focus for me here. There we go. Yep, and we can see the other connection also looks solid and well soldered with no sign of contamination or, uh, you know, and the wire's not pulling away from the leg or anything like that. So that's solid. Nothing to worry about. All right, so let me go ahead and get the bottom board back onto the bench here and we'll start reassembling our stack and wiring everything back together. Okay, so I've got my bottom board ready to go here. Uh, one correction from earlier is I said there was only going to there was five standoffs. So it turns out there was six. I had noticed there was an empty hole there, and I thought that it was for something else. But it turns out that the six standoff was just stuck to that middle board, and I hadn't noticed it until later on. So there are actually six standoffs, and we've replaced the shorter stock IRM ones with the taller ones. Um, another thing to note is there is a power connector here for the. Uh, M72 multi um, and uh, a power cable is supplied in the bag. That's going to just run up to the M72's main board. So let me go ahead and there we go, put that on. And there's likewise another power connector, which is the stock connector, um, which will run between the bottom board and the middle board. So um, I don't want to lift this sensitive board with one hand, so I'm going to uh, pause for just a second here and move the second board up into place, and then I'll show uh, reconnecting the ribbon cables and everything again. All right, so I've got the middle board mounted back on top again. Um, you can see that the clearance now between that middle board with the, you know, it clears that subboard nicely so we don't have any issues about, um, you know, that subboard rubbing on the bottom of the middle board, which is good. Definitely want to avoid that. And so uh, I already went and fastened it down. I went and, uh, you know, put in six fasteners here to hold this middle board down on top, um, making sure to put washers in between so that the screws don't uh, rub onto the board. 
So um, now we can go ahead and reconnect this original factory power connector that carries power between the two boards. Come on. There we go. And then, likewise, we have to reconnect the ribbon cables over here that carry data between the two boards. I think I'll be able to do that one handed. We'll find out. Let's see if we get the notches lined up here in the ribbon connector. Let's see how that would notch in. Yeah, sad to say, I think I'm not going to be able to get this with one hand. I'll have to use two hands to support it. So I'm going to cut here, reconnect those ribbon cables, and then I will set the top board, the A board, down next. Um, we didn't have to change anything with this board as far as uh, anything that would sit higher, so the uh, standoffs spacers that we've got here are, the, are those original ones, and we can just leave those in place. In fact, uh, there'd be problems anyway if we had to do anything taller since um, the A board goes and sits down into these white connectors. So it's really important that the spacing stay the same between the top board and the middle board. All right, so now I've set the A board on top and um, press the connections down. You know, there's a this connector here and this connector here are what carry the data from the top A board down to the middle B board. And um, I reapplied the original factory fasteners here that keep that held down tight and then just left the original plastic spacers that just uh, act like a shim right there. All right, so now we just have to finish making some more connections. We've got uh, this power cable, which comes from the uh, M72, M72 multi subboard underneath that we're gonna go ahead and connect up top there, just like that. And then there's this original factory power wire, which comes um, from the middle B board and connects to this power connector right here, so we'll put that back into place. Just like that. And put the wire back into its little holder there. Okay, and that should be it. We've got all our power cords in place, we've got all our data cables in place, we've got all of our fasteners tightened down, and uh, everything looks good, so we'll go ahead and move it back over to the uh, television here and hook it up to the super gun and find out if it'll actually play some video games for us. Alright, so I've got it back um, hooked up to the PVM and the super gun to uh, go ahead and try this out. Between the feet that I've added to the bottom and the taller spacers between the middle board and the bottom board, the whole stack sits quite a bit higher than it did before. Not that, that matters much, except it won't really slide under the TV like it used to here. All right, so the dip switches, which are used to select the game, are currently all set at the bottom position. Um, I actually don't have a chart of which game is on what setting, so I don't know what game will come up when we plug this in here, but let's find out. Go ahead and plug in the power. And that looks good. I think this is Air Battle, if I remember correctly, which obviously is a vertical game, so it wouldn't work. <laughs> I'd have to turn this monitor on its side, but... Oh, Air Duel. <laughs> yep, there we go. Sweet, everything's looking good. Let's make sure we can coin up here. Oh, now see, we got something up with the sprites. They're just showing up as gray blobs, so there must be something going on there. Yep, so the backgrounds are working correctly, but well, well, it looks okay there. And up and on. So I wonder if I don't have one of those e-drums suited correctly. 
it was hard to play one-handed and with the monitor turned off, the controls turned sideways. Okay, so yeah, there's obviously something not quite right with the character graphics, so I'm gonna go ahead and unplug it and uh, we'll do a little bit of troubleshooting here. Alright, so I'm coming back to uh, the test setup now after going and uh, setting the jumpers correctly on both the top A board and the bottom C board. Um, so we are ready to try this test again. Go ahead and plug in the power here. And once again, it is booting up to Air Duel. So far, so good. So we'll go ahead and clean up. All right, now those look like proper sprites and not blocks anymore. And we'll take the ship here and off we go. Yeah, that looks better. That's how this is supposed to work. Alright, good, 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 good. Alright, so let me go ahead and switch games to something I can play on a horizontal display. So I'm going to unplug the power here. And, as you said, the games are selected by these jumpers right here. There is a list of which jumpers bring up what, but I don't have it in front of me, so I'm just going to flip jumper number four. I'll power back on. Let's see what we get. It's the startup test pattern. Passes test, no, test pass. And hey, there's our type. Don't mind if I do blast off and strike the evil Bido Empire. Now, as I said at the beginning of this uh, video, there is a status bar at the bottom, but this monitor just cuts it off. So, I could mess around with the monitor settings and get it to show up, but I won't worry really about that here. Normally I'm much better at R-Type, but I'm trying to play this with one hand while holding the thing. Whoops. Works better if I shoot. Yeah, I think we're golden. Alright, one more game, just to make sure. So let me go ahead and unplug. And let's go ahead and move up by one tile. And we'll plug it back in again. Start up sequence. R-Type 2 is good to go. Go ahead and clean up. Hit start. Yep, this is looking good. Alright, I think we'll call that a successful installation. And uh, I plan on spending a lot of quality time in this. i have always been an IRM fanatic, and uh, having some of their very best games all running on original hardware has always been like a unicorn dream of mine. So this is exciting. All right, well, I'm going to sign off for now, and uh, we'll see you on the next project.